Welcome, everybody. It seems like it's been a long time since we've had a webcast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this one is a standards meeting outcome summary, but uh, there is also going to be some information that uh, we have determined uh, people would like to learn about. We're going to, uh, our speakers are going to talk about the uh, various types of SMPTE documents and uh, what they're used for and who, uh, who uses them and uh, uh, their purpose, etc. Um, I am your host, uh, Joel Welch, SMPTE's Director of Education. I'd like to give you a little bit of uh, housekeeping, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, the SMPTE uh, Technology Outcome Summary meetings, are uh, they happen quarterly. Uh, the webcasts are interactive. So our speakers summarize the activities uh, that occur at the most recent SMPTE Technology meetings. Um, the the uh, webcasts are complimentary for everyone. Sessions are recorded and published uh, on demand for viewing either on the SMPTE website or on YouTube, but our speakers who you really came to see are uh, Bruce Devlin, uh, SMPTE's uh, Standards Vice President, and uh, hello Bruce, Thomas Bousa Mason who is SMPTE's Director of Standards Development and on staff, uh, he's a teammate of mine, uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, Thomas. I think this is the first one that he is actually going to be speaking during, so um, uh, glad to have him on board. Uh, with that, uh, Bruce, I'm going to stop talking and uh, give you the floor. Excellent. Thank you, Joel. Um, I'm going to turn my webcam off because I live in a quaint English countryside village where back in uh, 1300 when they did the layouts, they didn't predict the internet and so the internet's a bit rubbish. So we'll turn that off um, so that you can hear me. All right, so today we're um, talking about standards. We're talking about the uh, most recent standards meeting and all the events that took place um, while we were there. Now I'm just trying to see my clicking is definitely doing something. Ah, there we go, right. Uh, so the most recent meeting took place in Canada. It was graciously hosted uh, by Ryerson University. And like all of the SMPTE standards meetings, there is a write-up which takes place. And you can read the report on the SMPTE website, uh, SMPTE.org forward slash standards forward slash outcome reports. And there's reports dating a, a few years back there. Um, in the background, you see lots of happy, smiling people uh, who turned up at the meeting on a nice, warm Canadian morning. Um, at the university and there were lots of young people around which effectively reduced the average age of the participants by about 30 years, which we were all very grateful for. The events themselves took place over four days. Uh, there were 45 people on site and if you include the people that dialed into the meetings, we had over 100 people in total. Ryerson were very good to us. They um, gave us this big room that you can see where we were located for most of the time, but we also had a second breakout room uh, for those smaller meetings that took place in parallel with the main meetings so that we could get the, get the work done. Each month, new projects start, old projects get closed, and so currently we have about 150 active projects on our books, um, which is a pretty good reflection of the amount of work that we get through in the SMPTE standards process. And in the last quarter, we published, I believe, 13 documents, be they revisions, updates, or new documents. Um, so that was probably a, a light month uh, for us, but it does show that we're getting um, many documents out. We're running at the sort of an average run rate of about uh, a document a week gets published from uh, the SMPTE standards body, which is really quite a big number. Uh, Thomas, let's just check that your microphone's working. Uh, anything you want to add to? Uh, yeah. Hey, facilities? Bruce. Uh, how are you doing? Hey, Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you just fine. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Yeah, no, I, 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 the only thing I, I would like to add is uh, we really had uh, participants uh, from around the world, and uh, uh, there are people from uh, Asia, Japan, China. Uh, we have people from Australia. Uh, Europe, Germany, France, uh, England, uh, you name it. So this is a truly uh, uh, global uh, event and, uh, you know, everybody uh, working together to for a common goal. Indeed. Thanks, Thomas. And if uh, 
the webcast that, that we're doing today lights your interest in taking part in one of the standards meetings. Uh, you can take part at one meeting for free. Uh, you don't have to be a standards uh, community member. Uh, you can turn up and sign the guest agreement and take part um, in, in any of these meetings. So you can turn up and um, have a look and see what we do. And we do encourage you to come along and, and see how the committees work. Um, it's uh, quite amazing the depth of technology that we talk about and it's amazing that there are so many people who know so much about so many things. It's, it's quite humbling in many ways. Uh, so if you're new to this, this is the standards structure that we have. Um, the SIMPTI standards structure along with the membership structure and everything is governed by our operations manual and if you want to read how this structure works you can read the uh, governance OM which talks about how SIMPTI is governed and it mentions the standards OM which is how standards operate. Um, the person who's responsible for making certain that the standards uh, run smoothly is the standards vice president, that's me. Um, so I'm a volunteer, I do this because I think standards are a, a jolly good thing. Um, and I'm ably assisted by my right-hand man, Thomas Bazer Mason, who's the Director of Standards Development. And you're on staff, right, Thomas? Uh, yeah, that's true. So I'm, I'm uh, sitting here in White Plants, uh, New York, and um, we have a nice office here. Um, and But we also, uh, you know, have uh, conferences all over the place uh, in, um, in on the West Coast as well and in Europe. Indeed. And so to actually run the standards organization, um, essentially Thomas and I are responsible for uh, making certain that everything runs smoothly. Uh, Thomas looks after the publishing pipeline and he's got staff that report to him um, that help him do that. And both of us, well, I, I chair and Thomas um, helps me look good um, by, by telling me all the things I need to know. I think it's the other way around. <laughs> oh, I'm not so sure, Thomas, I'm not so sure. Um, the Standards Committee is the committee that's responsible for the smooth running of standards. And on that committee, there are four standards directors, which are appointed by the standards vice president. There are the chairs of each of the technology committees. Um, if there is a subgroup to the Standards Committee, then the subgroup chairs also attend the Standards uh, Committee. And we have one subgroup chair at the moment who looks after software and software tooling um, and software processes within SIMPTI. So uh, this is uh, a group that's helping us uh, modernize some of the ways in which we do things. Uh, we have three staff who report to uh, Thomas. And of course, the previous SVP, Alan Lamshed, who did such an excellent job for four years, um, he is also on the Standards Committee. So this is the group uh, that makes certain that standards run well. Um, and then the actual work is done in the technology committees. And that's what we're going to be going through today. We're going to go through the reports from each of these technology committees. Essence looks at stuff, video, audio, compression, those kinds of things. Film looks at film. Film being, of course, um, that physical medium that you shine light through, uh, as opposed to digital cinema, uh, which is the uh, way to do cinema technology digitally including everything from how you represent the files to how you distribute encryption keys. Then we have television and broadband. This group looks at all of those services like subtitling, captioning, lip sync, um, uh, and some of the core technology for all of those non-video and audio elements. We have a cinema sound committee, which is doing some sterling work on immersive audio. Um, and for those of you who know the trademarks, those are things like Dolby Atmos, DTSX, um, MPEG-H and the like. Then we have metadata and registers. Um, in this immensely complex world in which we live, we have magic numbers that represent things like um, colors and sound fields. And all of those magic numbers have to be written down somewhere. And that's the job of the metadata and registers group, where all the magic numbers that power digital cinema, power IMF, power the underlying MXF, and control all of those things that you find in ancillary data. That's all controlled by the 30MR group. If it goes in a file, then it's covered by 31FS. And if it lives on a wire or a piece of fiber optic, then it's covered by 32NF. If you have to control it or are controlling it, uh, then TC34CS looks after it. So that's home to BXF and other such structures. And then IMF, which is the how you package up media, that lives in TC35PM. 
And so I've color coded these. So if it's infrastructure and management, that's gray. If it's applications, uh, those are yellow. And if it's to do with content and metadata, those are green. And as I mentioned, we've got 150 active projects. There are 350 different companies from 34 different countries representing the 10 TCs with a total of 840 members split up into 95 groups that report to all of these technology uh, committees. Uh, so it's a big job and um, Thomas and I are ably um, helped by all of the TC chairs who um, give us the information to make it sound like we actually know what we're talking about amongst all of these different groups. Yeah, this is a really, a truly a, a volunteer organization. I, I mean, there's more staff than the three you mentioned here. Uh, the three are dedicated to the standards development. We have other staff uh, looking at marketing membership. Uh, we have uh, education. Um, uh, Joel, who is on this webcast, he's the one who makes uh, possible that we can actually see this webcast. Uh, so there, there are a few more staff in SIMTI, but uh, the majority of the people involved in the standards development are um, uh, volunteers coming from all over the world. Excellent. Volunteer organization, globally driven. So as everyone who, anyone who's listened to any presentation I've ever done in the last 30 years knows, I like to do a little bit of audience interaction. Um, and this is where I put the pressure on Joel to um, formulate a poll that we can do towards the end of this webcast. So the next webcast will be in September, or probably October actually, just after the September block meetings. Uh, and we've, uh, we, we do a deep dive into each one of the technology committees. And then it's really, what would you like to know in addition to that at the next one of these webinars? We can talk about liaisons, which is how SIMPTI interacts with other organizations, other standards bodies and specifications bodies and industry groups. Uh, we can do a bit of a deep dive into the specifications pilot program, which by September we hope to have completed. Um, and SIMPTI's first specification will be uh, sitting on the SIMPTI website and we can tell you what specifications are all about. Um, and we can also talk about the upcoming annual technical conference because the next webcast will be in between IBC and the annual technical conference. Uh, so we can pull in some experts to tell you about the ATC. So we don't want your answers now, just have a think about it um, while we're talking through the various topics. And towards the end of this uh, webcast, we will ask your opinions. Oops, I pressed too many buttons there. It's a bit of lag. Right, there we go. So into the detail of what we've done in the technology committees. So one of the things that we do to organize ourselves within the standards community is we have a concept called projects. And we try and create one project per document that we're gonna put out. And if there are a number of different related projects, then we tend to have a controlling project to look after them. This does a little bit of housekeeping for us. So when we use the word project, in what we're going to be talking about. Pretty much that means a project gets created in order to monitor a group of people doing some work. It might just be one person who's revising a document uh, that needs its revision, or it could be a project that in turn generates a working group, that in turn generates a drafting group and a study group to do all sorts of interesting bits of work. So a project really is the way in which we monitor the work going on within the SMPTE. And this is a list of the new projects that were spawned between the last webcast I gave and this webcast. So we'll just go through a few of these and I'll uh, pause at the end of them uh, to see if Thomas wants to add any comments. And if you have any questions, please type them into the chat window or the comment window, or maybe even unmute yourself and, and say something. We're not that scary. We're quite happy to be interrupted. So the first new project is um, there's an do existing document called SIMPTI ST428 Part 7, and that is Subtitles for Digital Cinema, uh, Digital Cinema Distribution Master. And this project's been started uh, by a Japanese company who wants to improve the rendering of Japanese subtitles in digital cinema. Yeah, I think, I, I think you covered everything. Uh, what's to say there, Bruce? Indeed. Um, a lot of these should be quite short, we hope. Um, as you probably know, each standard that we publish has a one-year and a five-year review. So 
there's a standard called the Archive Exchange Format, AXF, which is simply SD34 Part 1, uh, and that's having its second revision to update some of the schemas. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we go into the um, uh, 31FS review. There are two projects that were created at the same time, these two here, the um, uh, two projects which were part of the specifications pilot program. So this is being done in conjunction with the DPP, the Digital Production Partnership in the UK. They report to 35PM, which is the IMF group, and effectively we're creating an IMF application DPP, and we're doing that in the form of a SIMPTI technical specification. Um, we don't have enough time today to go into the details of that technical spe specification or why it's a tech spec um, and not a standard, but there are some good reasons. And if you want to know more about that, we can go through it in the next standards webinar, because hopefully that pilot project will have completed by, uh, by this uh, September um, webinar. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting effort because uh, it brings IMF into the broadcast world uh, through DPP and uh, there's a similar effort going on in uh, an organization, the North American Broadcast Association. Um, so it's it's really interesting to see how the versioning approach of IMF is trickling down to the, the broadcast world. Absolutely. So the next two projects are one-year reviews of published standards. So effectively, the standard has been published. After one year, each of the technology committees should open up the document, have a look at the document, and check that there's been no issues found, uh, no implementers have found problems with it. Um, so this is these are one-year reviews of um, the dual link and quad link SDI standards. Yeah, there's quite a bit of um, application still uh, built on SDI. So uh, video over IP is just emerging. So SDI is still an important uh, uh, area of uh, uh, revision for us in SMT. Absolutely. I, I hate to think exactly how many SDI connectors are in active use all the way around the world every day. It's, a, it's going to be a big and crazy number. <laughs> the next um, standard is, or actually it's an RDD, a registered disclosure document, and we'll go into those later on. And this is the uh, an IMF document, and it's the isochronous stream of XML documents. And it's a plugin. So in other words, this is a bit of technology which is appropriate for all IMF applications. And the goal is to allow you to create a stream of XML documents where there's one XML document for each and every frame of an IMF composition. Joel, you have appeared. We, we have uh, a question, but we also have a comment from uh, Andy Q that I wanted to share right away. Um, Andy Q says, uh, what do you mean trickling down? Ha! Yeah, I was wondering up, who's going to say something about that. Up to TV. He says, up to TV and online, please. <laughs> Uh, apologies Thank for that. You. I probably should have uh, used a different term. <laughs> yeah, I think you're buying the beers next time we see Andy. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> this could be expensive, this webinar business, you know, Thomas. <laughs> Moving uh, on. By the right. He accepted your offer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he might. Uh, right, next one is revision of 2042 part four, which is mapping of VC2 into MXF. Um, so anyone who's been following uh, the broad work of SIMPTI will know that as the high uh, dynamic range ecosystem starts to move its way through the different compression and carriage standards, you'll know that many of the carriage standards and compression standards need to be updated uh, for UHD, wide color gamut and high dynamic range provisions. So this VC2 standard or um, Dirac as it's popularly known is being updated to carry some of those properties for wide color gamut and high dynamic range. If you've been reading your SIMPTI journal, you will have seen uh, the occasional UHD SDI roadmap poster appear in your, um, uh, in your letterboxes uh, or appear in your inboxes if you're on the digital subscription. Um, and so there's uh, a new project to uh, do more work on EG2111 part two, which is part of uh, that poster series of engineering guidelines. And they're 
they truly are works of love by the guys that are, are putting these posters together. They're very informative and help explain very quickly the uh, incredible complexity of putting UHD um, onto SDI and onto IP. So there's a revision of RP200, uh, one of the older documents that we have, which talks about reference levels. Um, the current version of RP200 talks about reference levels for things like 5.1 and 7.2 Sandfield groups in cinema. Uh, and now this one, uh, this revision is now talking about updating those reference levels for object sound and uh, the uh, various immersive sound technologies that are being worked on at the moment. There is a revision of ST2094 part 40, which is one of the high dynamic range dynamic metadata standards. Uh, this is dynamic data. In other words, it, it allows you to carry metadata required for high dynamic range on a scene by scene or frame by frame basis. And implementations have discovered a few bugs in 2094 part 40. And so this is a project revision to update uh, the metadata to reflect what's actually done in the implementations. There's a new project to cover the issue triage for IMF. Now IMF is one of the projects that's uh, trying to improve the way that we track bugs within SMPTE. So IMF is using GitHub as a tool for uh, tracking issues that we find within the document standards. Uh, and those issues are collected, we then triage them, and those then spawn revision projects or amendment projects to update the underlying standards. And we'll, we'll show you an example page of that later on in the presentation. You, you might have already recognized that IMF is uh, a, a very uh, important project for Sinti, and uh, uh, there's quite a bit of activity around it. So the next couple of projects are again um, one year reviews of published standards. Um, so the, the first two were ST2081 and these two are 2082. So again, they were traveling through SMPTE uh, together and they're reaching their one year review together. Another big topic um, is the immersive audio that I've already mentioned. This is the object sound uh, technologies. Uh, so this one is cinema related. There wasn't um, uh, synchronization, uh, sorry, said that the wrong way around. So ST430 part 12 covers uh, audio synchronization and that needs to be amended in order to cope with the uh, immersive audio standards. Uh, and the final one is that we created a number of different projects to cover media microservices. This is a, uh, a new group of projects that have been created inside 34CS, uh, working with the um, uh, some Chinese broadcasters here to try and generate uh, a microservices architecture that's appropriate for the command control and management of media within a broadcast facility. Yeah, this is an interesting project because it uh, uh, is the first I think we have, which is kind of aiming at uh, uh, software development. Indeed, very, very software-y, right at the core of software rather than being a sort of a hybrid hardware one. So let's go through uh, 10E. We're going to try and spend about five minutes per uh, technology committee. So we're going to go reasonably quickly. Um, if you have questions, please type them into chat or unmute yourself. Um, and if you type them into chat, then uh, Joel will unmute himself and, and appear by video webcam um, at the end of the 10E section and he'll it causes us to stop and read out your questions. So 10E is all about essence, it's all about the stuff, it's all about the compression. We've talked about the new projects. So the ongoing work within um, SMPTE, uh, the first slide we've got here is about video compression. So a new project from three months ago was the VC6 suite, uh, commonly known as the Perseus compression system. Uh, this is quite a novel compression system. So there's an awful lot of new terms and definitions and concepts. And we've got a core team of people who attend the weekly drafting sessions uh, to try and figure out what's the best way of explaining this new compression scheme. So if you're familiar with things like MPEG and JPEG or VC2 and DIRAC, if you're familiar with those, then VC6 is absolutely nothing like them at all. It's completely different and really totally novel. Um, so to be 
perfectly honest, we're struggling to find a good way of concisely representing all of these terms. Um, and if you're interested in compression, please, please, please join VC6 or VC5 or the VC2 projects, because we do need more compression experts to come along and join these drafting group meetings to help make the documents better. One of the things that the drafting group has promised is to make a reference decoder available as part of the work. And we're making very good progress. In fact, literally three or four minutes before we started this webcast, um, we were finishing up the, the VC6 meeting. Um, and it looks like we're on schedule, hopefully, um, to get a document which we can put in front of the TC and see if it's ready for its first ballot this quarter. So things are going quite well. VC5, commonly known as the Cineform or GoPro um, High Quality Codec. Uh, the very last part of this multi-part document, which is the metadata, is just about ready for FCD ballot. Uh, still a little bit of ongoing work. They meet uh, uh, weekly or bi-weekly. Uh, the finishing touches are being put on that. Um, and it's quite likely that when the metadata is finished, there may be some uh, work required on the part two, which is the conformance spec, to update the conformance to touch that metadata. And the final compression job that's going on at the moment is the Dirac VC2 suite. Uh, the conformance suite is being updated to include UHD, high dynamic range, and wide color gamut modes. Yeah, we, we should uh, maybe mention that um, uh, most of these uh, codecs we have in SIMT uh, come with uh, uh, a reference decoder, some piece of software, and um, we have a, a GitHub uh, account and uh, I think that's where the um, the software is uh, uh, deposited, right? That's our repository for um, uh, these uh, uh, reference decoders. Absolutely. And, you know, as I said earlier, if you're interested in this sort of work and you want to have a play with the reference decoder for VC5 or the reference decoder for RDD36 or ProRes, as it's, as it's known, or the reference decoder for VC2, uh, join the standards community. Uh, subscribe to 10E and that will give you access to these reference decoders that you can uh, use to check that implementations and the specification are working well. The next bunch of projects in 10E, the Essence Group, uh, is some work on SD2080, which is reference display management, manage, I can't speak today, measurement and calibration. So there's still some drafting work going on um, in the part two of the document. Um, and part four, the full measurement and calibration document, uh, is restarting its FCD uh, ballot after some clarifying comments were made uh, that caused the, uh, uh, the FCD ballot to restart. Now, it's worth mentioning that the reference display is an important piece of work because in this new high dynamic range world in which we live, uh, having a reference display so that the uh, people calibrating monitors, calibrating what they see in production, uh, have some chance of knowing how that signal will be seen all the way through the pipeline, all the way to the end consumer. Part of that is how do you illuminate the room in which you've got the reference display? And that's what the television lighting consistency index is all about. And this document, RP2093, is in pre-FCD review and contains a ton of uh, formulas and measurement techniques to explain how um, you should light an environment so that you can actually watch the monitor correctly. Um, SD2086 was revised three months ago and that is now published and available on the store. The P3 colorimetry project is ready for its pre-FCD review. Um, it was pointed out that there wasn't a standard for P3 colorimetry and so somebody wrote it down. Good old SIMT. Yeah, I was really surprised that uh, there wasn't a standard there for that yet. And uh, yeah. most, I think most of the HDR stuff, uh, if it comes to what color gamut, uh, actually covering P3. And uh, uh, so that, that's uh, really a need in the market. Yeah, it is, it's quite amazing how uh, the industry can be really, really, really well documented in certain areas. And then when somebody asks the question, you know, where's P3 defined? There's this collective drawing in a breath and a big sort of, oh, moment. Um, and then we have to decide whether or not it's a good thing to do or not a good thing to do. And in this case, it was decided it was a good thing to do and off we jolly well go. And there's now a P3 colorimetry standard. The um, FS gamut, FS log characteristics of camera uh, systems, those documents um, 
nearly ready um, for their FCD ballot. They've been around for quite a while and there's still some work going on in 30MR, the metadata and registry group, to get the universal labels, that's what UL stands for, uh, to wait for those ULs to become mature so that those documents then can then go into their FCD ballot. And finally, there's a new study group on virtual reality and augmented reality, and that's kind of a funky topic nowadays. And we got some liaison in our inboxes just this week from the virtual reality industry format uh, forum saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if uh, SMPT and the BRIF uh, work together and exchange information to make certain we're doing good stuff on VR and AR? And so uh, we're currently working on that liaison now. Yeah, this, this study group is really looking at um, uh, production of uh, virtual reality content. So if you're interested to join, um, the you know, please join. Um, it's an interesting discussion. Absolutely. So we'll just have a little pause to see if anybody's got any questions and is brave enough to unmute. We'll see if Joel <laughs> reappears in the webcam space. Well, Joel won't reappear in the webcam space right now, but... Um, I'm disappointed. Ah. Uh, uh, but I do want to invite our guests to ask questions now. You can type them in, but will you definitely prefer uh, verbal questions? If you'd like to speak directly to either Thomas or Bruce, just type in, I have a verbal question, and you go right to the top of the list. Um, we have uh, we have a, a, a question here uh, from uh, a guest who uh, has left the webcast, but I'm going to read it uh, exactly as it's typed. Uh, SMPTE issued a white paper in 2004 that discussed serious acoustic flaws in existing standards like S202. Uh, we've been waiting for some project to fix these issues. They affect home audio work. Why hasn't this work been started? What a fantastic question. So I refer back to a statement that Thomas made and that we put on the screen, which is that SMPTE is a volunteer organization. And if somebody cares about that and it really does affect what consumers experience, then I urge anyone who cares about that to bring a project to SMPTE. If somebody is willing to drive that, I know for a fact that there will be other audio experts who will join in um, and help with the work. But we really do need proponents to come along um, and help get the work organized and get people to to join in and, and, and start to discuss these topics. Um, I'm not an audio expert, so it ain't going to be me. Um, Thomas, you're one of the coordinators who people come to to say, hey, can we do work? How, how yeah, do I mean, it, um, obviously, you know, ping me and, and let me know. And um, uh, we we get the, an effort started. Um, this uh, particular white paper is uh, a bit before my time. so. I apologize, uh, I, I probably have to uh, dig a little bit to find out what actually happened. But, um, you know, as, as Bruce said, you know, as more uh, volunteers you have, as uh, faster these um, these efforts come off the ground and uh, proceed. And um, uh, a volunteer need is always needed, uh, volunteer work is always, uh, volunteer help is always needed. And okay. as they say, many hands make light work. Uh, I think it was Hans Hoffman who said that actually. Although many Hans Hoffmans might be a bit scary. <laughs> Edward asks, what is the procedure to bring a project to SMPTE, please? So there are, there's a couple of things you need to do. Um, the first is to get in touch with someone at SMPTE and say, hey, is this a good thing for SMPTE? And Thomas and myself are the, probably the best points of contact to start that conversation. Um, Thomas is on staff and in theory has more spare time than I do. Um, but in practice, <laughs> uh, getting hold of either of us might involve a little bit of nagging just to make certain that we respond. So once you've once you've got your project, um, you, you discuss it with Thomas or myself to, to figure out that it's a decent project. Then we have a form that you fill in to get your thoughts organized about what the scope of your project is, because the most important thing about your scope is knowing when you're finished. So we like scopes to be fairly constrained. Uh, not to bleed into too wide an area so the projects go on forever because we like things to finish and we like them to result in documents. And so there'll be a group of people. Th Thomas is the main man here. He will he will help you get that um, document completed and make certain that you've got a good scope and there's a chance that you'll finish in your own lifetime, which is important. Then that document comes to me and I decide uh, which technology committee it should go to. But pretty much whoever's proposing it 
working with Thomas will know that already and I just nod and agree with him because you know, Thomas knows what he's doing. And at that point, it goes to the TC chairs. The TC chairs then put it onto our project system and it has a two week review period where that technology committee and the standards committee then review the project, make certain that there's nothing missing, make certain that you can finish it in appropriate time, make certain that it will result in the document you claim it's gonna result in. And after that two week review, your project starts and you do work. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get on these requests for new projects as fast as I can. And uh, uh, it maybe uh, we should also mention that if you're interested to get feedback on if this is a good uh, project for Simti, we have uh, a quarterly face-to-face uh, -face meetings. And uh, some of the people in the past who, who started efforts came to these meetings. And there's a standards community meeting uh, where you can uh, have a presentation, uh, talk to people face-to-face and get some feedback and um, uh, maybe even get your project, project started. Okay, uh, we do have a couple more questions here. Um, okay. Mike's, Mike's question is, uh, will the new monitor calibration standards or RP uh, provide a recommended bridge from current field practice uh, us color bars for Pluge setting to new patterns in 2080 that will result in a different setting? So this is one of those questions where had you stopped after about word 10, I probably would have been able to respond, but then it got detailed and you're way out of my comfort zone here. Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Uh, Thomas, is this an area of your expertise? Uh, sorry, I, I was distracted. Could you repeat the question? Certainly, um, and I'll, I'll try to try to uh, read it read it correctly here. Uh, will the new monitor calibration standards or RP provide a recommended bridge from current field practice use color bars, or will it use color bars for uh, pluge setting to newer patterns in 2080 that will result in a different setting? I, I, I'm afraid I have to pass too. But if you send me that me uh, that question in an email, um, then I can uh, send it up to the um, TC chairs, and uh, uh, we can find an answer for, on that question. I tell you what, I will uh, send it to you privately in the chat, and uh, we have the the person's name, full name, and uh, contact information. And we can get back to them. Fantastic. Good question. I one more question, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. From Chris. How does SIMTI engage with its members currently outside of conferences to make them aware of projects where subject matter experts are needed to help volunteer? That's a very good question. We try to do it with webcasts like this. We try to do it by um, petitioning the standards community reflector. Um, we've kind of stayed clear of doing general mail shots to non simpty mailing lists. Um, it tends to be within the standards community so far, but I'd really quite like to widen uh, th that call for experts, if you like, to have a better mechanism. We don't have um, a great mechanism for doing it outside the people who are already standards community members. Um, and if anybody has any good suggestions, uh, please contact Thomas or myself because uh, this is an area of concern for me at the moment, particularly on some of the newer technologies like microservices. Um, there does seem to be a correlation uh, between having gray hair and not really understanding microservices properly. Uh, and that's a worry of mine as my hair is getting grayer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd like to add that um, we also try to be uh, present in uh, other organizations. So we have liaisons with many other organizations and we're intending uh, our conferences and uh, exhibitions. So. Uh, we have um, uh, a SIMTI booth at uh, uh, NAB and IBC. Uh, there are SIMTI events, SIMTI conferences at uh, both of these events, uh, NAB and IBC. Um, we are, I get the, have the pleasure to travel around to, to other organizations where there are conferences and uh, we give presentations to update people on uh, what is happening. Um, you know, so it's, uh, they, there's a lot of, um, outreach to other organizations, uh, conferences, uh, where we try to reach people and, uh, um, you know, get the message out on uh, what SIMTI is working on. 
And there is a there is a question about microservices, but I think you have a section on that. So uh, we'll we do. When we get to thirty four CS, if you could read that one out, that'd be fine. Uh, very well. That's the Excellent. end of the questions. Thank you. So the Film Technology Committee twenty F. Uh, doesn't tend to meet along with the uh, digital technologies um, and there was no meeting this round although they do have a new project which we've previously mentioned about the revision of RP200. Next committee is the Digital Cinema Technology Committee chaired by Steve Lannan and Chris Rhythm with them um, and this is pretty much everything to do with uh, digital cinema. We mentioned the new projects already and there's a bunch of ongoing work um, where we're amending the DCP operational constraints, that's waiting on universal labels to be mature inside 30MR. Uh, there's an update to the DCDM image characteristics, which is currently in FCD ballot. There is an update to SMPTE 428 part 2, which is the DCinema uh, packaging operational constraints. Um, there's actually two revisions going on in parallel here. One revision is adding frame rates to add things like 100 frames per second and another revision is there to accommodate the stereoscopic subtitles which is awaiting universal labels from the 30MR group. Now we had a long discussion in the committee about which one's going to be ready first and so we've changed slightly the way in which these amendments um, or revisions are taking place and that we've turned the first one, the frame rates, into an amendment and if the revision for stereoscopic subtitles is available when the amendment passes all of its balloting procedures then the amendment will apply to that stereoscopic subtitle revision but if the stereoscopic subtitle revision is not available then the amendment will apply to the original document. So if we think we found a way of unblocking the procedures yet still having a due process that works and that was an interesting and heated debate um, in uh, at Ryerson University. There's a revision of 429 part 4 which is the DCP MXF JPEG 2000 which is undergoing FCD ballot there are a few little minor updates to that and a whole bunch of work um, on immersive audio uh, which has been dependent on this document simply 20 <coughs> excuse me, SMPTE 2098 part 2, uh, which is now becoming unblocked. And because of that, that one's unblocked, I'm expecting a lot of these documents to suddenly start to flow through the uh, SMPTE standards uh, procedure in, in the coming weeks and months. A couple of other immersive audio ones, again, uh, we've mentioned, which is updating of key delivery messages and the FSK sync signal uh, that work with immersive audio. And again, SMPTE 2098 part uh, two has been the document, the immersive bitstream format document, which has kind of been the blocking document for a lot of this immersive audio uh, work within 21DC and the uh, Cinema Surround Group. Any questions on 21DC? There are no questions at this time. Excellent. So moving on, and just to make certain that uh, Thomas gets one of his actions done, um, I apologize that we don't have a cartoon Thomas to go with the cartoon Bruce. Um, I have commissioned <laughs> my daughter to draw one, um, but you heard it here that Thomas promises to send me a photograph of himself that my daughter can draw. Um, so you'll have a cartoon Thomas for the next time around. There you go, Thomas. Yeah, There's yeah. no one record on YouTube. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting a lot of effort into thinking how I want to present myself. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I keep you updated on, on progress. Oh, thank you, mate. All right, the next committee is Television Broadband and Media. It has a new chair, Bill Miller, because uh, Mike Dolan, the previous chair, had reached his term limit. Uh, the, our operations manuals force us to change chairs regularly to keep things fresh. So Bill Miller is the new chair who has extensive experience in this area. So there's a suite of documents, SMPTE ST 2064, uh, on AV sync measurement and assessment. So in other words, have we got lip sync? Uh, parts one and two, the fingerprint generation and transport, those are undergoing their one year review. And the engineering guideline, which explains how it all works, uh, that's currently in draft. Then there's a suite of documents called OBID, uh, which is basically for transferring IDs inside an audio tone watermark 
and anybody who is at NAB or going to IBC, if you search the apps for Taxi Demo, T-A-X-I, you'll see this stuff in action um, and really working as part of those taxi demonstrations. So there's a bunch of documents that have been published and the final two little bits um, have been elevated to draft publication, so we're expecting those to be published next time round as well. And finally, in uh, 2040B is the active format description and bar data that's been updated so that uh, if we want to signal black bars uh, for letterbox or pillar box that's been updated to cover UHD. No, I just wanted to mention that OBIT is, is uh, quite an interesting uh, effort uh, as it really enables content uh, creators to see uh, where their content is consumed and uh, it's uh, uh, enables really this, this um, uh, monetization of content and getting the content to uh, the platforms uh, where it's really consumed. Yeah, I remember having a conversation with a guy from Uyala when I explained that before Obid, there was no real mechanism for tracking that what you had made was actually broadcast. And they just looked at me with big open eyes going, what? And broadcasting's been around since 1930? Um, so it's quite revolutionary in many ways yet some communities think it should have been there already. <laughs> and it really works, it's it's great technology. Uh, any questions on TC24? We have no questions in the queue. Uh, I will remind our guests to uh, please type in your questions, but uh, we would uh, prefer, if you would, to just type in, I have a verbal question, and when the time comes, I'll unmute you. You can speak directly to our presenters. And we would love that, and we promise to be very respectful. Thomas and I don't have to be respectful to each other, but we will be respectful to you, we promise. I think we're respectful to each other. Well, we're kind of respectful. Well, we're, we're good <laughs> friends anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 25 CSS is the Cinema Sound Systems Technology Committee, which is awfully more difficult to say than it looks, chaired by Brian Long and Bill Redman. And thank you to Brian Long for stepping up to be a first time chair of a technology committee. So the projects here are really to do with immersive audio. Um, so immersive audio, object audio, there's lots of different words for the for the same thing. Um, and the, uh, the big hitter document here really is the 2098 uh, part two immersive audio bitstream specification. Um, and there's been an awful lot of work go gone into this document and it really is a, a, a thing of beauty. And a lot of these other documents where you see work restarting, um, they've kind of been paused waiting on this bitstream specification and consequently the um, immersive audio metadata uh, getting to a point where they've passed FCD ballot, they're going into draft publication and are about to be published. So this is an immense piece of work by uh, that technology committee and I'm, I'm really in awe of what they've managed to achieve. Um, there was a study group on immersive audio implementation. A report was created. That report is available to TC members and as a result of that, the group has been dis disbanded. And if you want to read that report, um, please join uh, TC25 CSS and you can download that and have a jolly good read. Any questions on Cinema Sound? There are no questions in the queue at this time. And we shall move on to metadata and registers, chaired by John Hurst and Mike DeValue. So as mentioned, all the magic numbers that go into MXF, IMF, digital cinema, blanking, everything that needs a name or an XML schema or a, um, a term that needs to be remembered by SMPTE, uh, it goes into metadata and registers. And if you attended the last webcast, uh, massive thanks to John Hurst who gave us a walkthrough of the registers, showed us what there was. And if you've not played with them, go to simptira.org. It's uh, unusual, you can download everything for free. You can get XML schema that you can base your software on, whether you want to hack something together just to see how the world works, or whether you're building a product, all of that information you can just download. So the project's going on within 30MR. There's a bunch of work going on um, on UMID, the Unique Material ID, and there's some projects in Japan that are using UMIDs as a kind of self-generating MAM system. Um, and so the application of UMIDs really covers that kind of work. Uh, there's been a few pauses 
in that work and a protocol to query UMID systems, um, but I'm expecting that work to pick up again towards the end of the year. Uh, SIMT 330, which is the uh, the draft of revising the UMID, proto uh, UMID specification, that's very close to pre-FCD review, and I'm expecting that once that document's done um, and enters uh, un sorry, undergoes its FCD ballot, I expect some of this other UMID work to then uh, kick off or restart again because uh, the group doing the work, it's all the same people, uh, and this is the number one priority at the moment. To store our registers, to remember our stuff, whether that stuff is a label like, hey, this codec is J2K, or whether it's a value such as um, the dial norm is minus 23 dB, or whether it's a group, which is something like um, this group of parameters is what you need to describe the image characteristics of a ProRes image. All of that stuff um, goes into different sorts of registers. We've got a new register called the element register, and document 2088 describes how that register works, what the structure is. It received quite a few comments when it went to ballot. Those comments are now being resolved, and I'm optimistic that the um, essence element metadata register key structure uh, will be finished pretty soon so that we can open up the essence element register for business. There's a document called 355, ST355, which is really the, the fundamental structure of each essence element. And an essence element is something that has a value such as height, width, um, loudness, all of those things um, have values. 335 defines how that dictionary, how that register works, and that's now ready for ST audit. So all of the um, discussions and changes which have taken many, many months um, and were very, very detailed, the experts have done a brilliant job, uh, and that's now ready uh, to be published as soon as it gets through ST audit. The digital object identifier name and entertainment ID or IDA, IDA identifier, um, that document 2079 has been revised. That's ready for pre-FCD review, and that should go through ballot. Um, the revisions weren't too major, so I'm hoping that will just slip through FCD ballot uh, and end up in the publication queue by the time we get to the next meeting round in September. I should also just mention the way that the registers themselves are published. If you go to the SIMTRA website, um, you'll see that there's a, a button that takes you to metadata registers. There's a button for published. There's a button for um, in development. Uh, and there's a, uh, a button for the stuff that's being put into the registers. So we publish these snapshots regularly. The current revision that's about to be published has a code name called Ponzu. And if I thought hard enough, I could remember exactly why um, it's called Ponzu, but I can't because my brain's a bit tired at the moment. And the next one that comes along will be called Tabasco. Uh, for some reason, the guys that do it like sources, um, and they will have a bit of a source theme going to them. There's also a DG activity to record essence elements, which will eventually end up in this essence element key structure. But because we haven't got the register yet, because the document's not finished, we need somewhere to remember the stuff that will go in there in the meantime. And so this work is going on as a drafting group to remember all the values and write them all down so that once we've got a key structure, we can then put them into the register and undergo the process defined in AG18 uh, to make all of those values correct. Just a reminder, please go to the SIMPTI Registers website. If you haven't been, I really do recommend it. It's a fantastic piece of work that was gifted to SIMPTI by some fantastic engineers at the BBC. Um, we really, I personally worship the work that they have done. It's made us look extraordinarily professional. And as mentioned, the registers that are published appear there. The draft registers um, are in here and the development stuff that's still in committee goes there. So click on that one, you get Ponzu. When Ponzu is published, it will end up just here. Any questions on metadata registers? There are none. And yes, I do understand that this is literally reading a dictionary. But dictionaries are pretty important because without someone remembering all these magic numbers, all the infrastructure just wouldn't hold together. We'd be relying on people writing this stuff down in spreadsheets. And we tried that for a decade and it really didn't work. 
So the next group is File Formats and Systems, 31FS, chaired by Paul Gardner and another youthful first time chair, Fred Walls. Thank you, Fred, for stepping up to the plate and becoming a chair of a technology committee. It's a bit scary the first time, uh, but we always would like new technology committee chairs. So 31FS is largely concerned with all things MXF, AF, AXF and DPX. So there's a bunch of um, documents uh, that I'm actually the editor for and I've been a little bit busy over the last three months and not really made much progress so it's all my fault for which I do apologize. Um, so the revision of 377 part one is the last revision of MXF that, that re references the old register structure. As soon as this is published we will start work on a new version of MXF that re references the new register structure and we will probably also chop up 377 part one into smaller documents, one to do with the physical structure, i.e. the KLV coding, and one to do with the logical structure, which is the object model and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this will improve the management of MXF and hopefully will make it a little bit more responsive. A document which extends MXF by extending the KLV encoding syntax uh, that's 377 part two, and that's been under development and, and under use for probably about ooh, nearly a decade now. Uh, we've finally overcome some of the um, issues with that document, and now that's ready for DP vote. Uh, some of the issues were actually in revising the metadata dictionaries themselves. ST335 was actually blocking this document, so that's now unblocked, and we're good to go on that. Uh, descriptive metadata scheme one, um, I managed to unblock that one. That's ready for DP vote. Text-based mappings of metadata into MXF. That revision has five comments, which I am still to revolve, revolve, resolve even. Um, just breaking the teeth in for a horse. Uh, 381 part two is mapping MPEG streams into MXF. That's now been published. Hooray! Um, as mentioned, updating Dirac to include UHD. They are drafting uh, ST2042 part four. There is uh, ST 2034 part two, which is the external bundles referencing in the archive exchange format. They're still in, uh, still drafting that and going through some quite tortuous uh, metadata gymnastics to make that work. And the DPX format is being extended to include high dynamic range, and that's undergoing its second FCD comment resolution. It's interesting how DPX uh, uh, is still uh, in such a use, and uh, I think DPX, the, the actual standard, was archived at some point, and, uh, but it seems there's still uh, interest in the industry to uh, extend DPX and make it HDR capable. It is pervasive, and you know, it has some issues. People jokingly say uh, you need a telephone to make it interoperate, and that might be true and there's some fantastic work being done by Fred Walls and the team on this revision uh, to try and get over the telephone interop uh, version of DPX and actually be able to interrupt by reading the document. I think they've done some sterling work there. Any 31FS questions? There are not. You are free to proceed to the next section. Excellent. 32NF. So 32NF, the Network and Facilities Committee, if it's on a wire it's in 32NF or on an optic cable it's in 32NF. These guys have had a massive workload over the last few years to incorporate high dynamic range and wide color gamut uh, signaling and concepts into all of these uh, into all of these standards. Um, so I'm going to run through them relatively quickly and, and do them as a group. So there's a whole bunch of uh, new projects for uh, one year of use coming up. The posters, there's lots of work ongoing in the posters. Uh, there's been some documents published and there's a bunch of documents that are coming through to do with high dynamic range and wide color gamut signaling, which are just about ready for pre-FCD review. There's been such a large volume of documents that have undergone this process uh, that they're dribbling through the, uh, the committees sequentially because there's a relatively small team of only five or six people working on this. And there's been a, an enormous volume of like 20 or 30 documents that they've had to get through. Yeah, still a lot of interest in uh, working on SDI. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There was some work started on SDI pathological condi conditions, but when the study was done for what are the pathological conditions for UHD on SDI, 
it was kind of figured that, well, this isn't actually going to occur and it's not really helping the industry very much. Um, and it turned into a kind of make work project. So the committee took the decision uh, to stop drafting and close the projects because um, SDI pathological conditions for UHD wasn't really a thing and we weren't helping the industry by updating that EG. ANC packets in an MPEG-2 transport stream, uh, that's currently doing its pre-FCD comments, so I expect that to hit ballot before the next set of block meetings. And then the large suite of video over IP documents, uh, there's still some being uh, drafted, so part 22, which is compressed mono essence, single essence stream over multiple ports, um, AS3 transparent transport, that one really should be close to uh, being published. I expect that to be published before September. Um, ancillary data has been published, so that was um, another one to come out. Um, 2022 part eight, which is the timing of 2022 part six streams when they're being sent in a 2110 part 10 system. That's um, That was an interesting document to try and position it correctly within SMPTE. That's undergoing a ballot. Um, seamless switching of RTP datagrams. Um, that's undergone its FCD ballot and there's still a few DP comments because as a result of updating the comments in the FCD ballot, um, some things might have been broken and that's what these comments are resolving. And variable bit rate MPEG-2 transport streams on IP networks, that's currently in its FCD ballot. So this is all about taking existing technologies and putting them onto IP or using the new SD2110 infrastructure to put um, essentially uh, raw data onto an IP network. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, all about live streams and uh, I think ST2110 is probably more used in uh, in a control room setting while ST2022 uh, is a more contribution link uh, uh, topic. Absolutely, and it really comes down to are you uncompressed or are you compressed? Do you want it all together or do you want it all split up? And it's it's still an interesting debate, and I think, Thomas, your very short summary is possibly the golden rule of today. And I watch with interest to see if that golden rule changes at all over time. Yeah. There's a lot of work going on on time labels and synchronization. Um, there's a, a report about the interop, uh, which is available for download. If you uh, click on that link, it'll and search for interop testing for 2059, you can get there. There's a new time labeling system. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on about this. This is basically how do we replace something like time code with a label that works for multiple frame rates, works for audio samples. Um, it's far too detailed for us to go into at the moment. However, if you think it's a good topic for um, a future deep dive, we will do that in a standards webcast. Just let us know in the chat um, and we will add it to the schedule probably as a Christmas present. Um, because if we get two or three experts involved discussing this, I guarantee there will be heated debate and discussion on the live webcast, which is always good fun. Some some Christmas present to have. <laughs> Abs absolutely, yes. We'll put a bow on it and call it a, call it a present. Um, and then there's always data going into AES, and AES um, audio ends up going coming back into SDI or back onto Simply 2110. So the complex networks that people build when they're putting systems together, there's still a lot of work going on with things like the audio definition model for um, uh, for defining your your object-based uh, immersive audio fields, defining that as data, putting it into an AS stream, and then putting it back onto SD2110. All of these things have to work, and that's really what uh, the 32NF committee is up to. And the most important announcement is, unfortunately, John Hudson has had to step down as chair of TC32NF, 32NF. Um, and so if you're young and enthusiastic or old and enthusiastic or just enthusiastic um, and would like to help out in this really fascinating work with video and IP uh, and help organize some of this work, I'm looking for a new uh, TC chair. Please get in touch with Thomas or myself. Um, if you would like to be considered, I really would like to have a volunteer without having to go and find someone and um, encourage them to be voluntold, tiered, or whatever the correct use of that verb is. Joel, do we have any questions on 32NF? 
Um, we do have a question here. Uh, before I ask it, though, what is the best way for uh, someone to contact either you or Thomas? Um, I know that there are links on the Simpty.org website that would allow them to contact you. Should they use those, or um, is email or telephone better? The, the links on the website are just fine. I believe our official emails, which I am SVP for Standards Vice President at Simpty.org, and Thomas is dir, D -I -R, dot standards at simpty.org. Um, that will get to us as well. Um, all communication mechanisms work. Uh, you can tweet me at Mr. MXF. You can tweet Simpty Connect. Anything, just any volunteering mechanism will work. If you volunteer, we will find you. Yeah, I, I think I prefer email because that's, uh, uh, that guarantees you're not forgotten. Absolutely. Great. Okay, so the question is from Alexander. Um, at a SEMPTI UK session earlier this year, there was a call for contr contributors to create a 2110 specification for OB in the UK so that trucks could interconnect, etc. Did that ever take off? So this was a SEMPTI UK initiative because there was a lot of work going on with um, uh, BT Sports and with Sky and with uh, the BBC in terms of 2110 truck technology. I believe that a volunteer within the Simpty UK community has been found to try and get the Simpty UK uh, people organised. Uh, the volunteer wasn't me um, and I became SVP at the time and, and kind of lost track a little bit, but I believe the goal was to kickstart that work um, around the IBC time in the UK to gather requirements to make sure that the work needs to be done and from those requirements a standards project would be created and then that work would either become a standard, an RP or an EG and we'll tell you how you make that decision at the end of this presentation. Thank you. The only question we have is uh, the one on microservices and we will wait until we get to that section. And we're at that section right now. So I'll, I'll do the spiel and then we'll go straight to that question. So uh, TC34CS is Media Control Systems uh, and Services. Chris Lennon and Carl Paulson are the chairs, both people who are highly experienced in this area. So uh, TC34CS was really created when BXF, the broadcast exchange format, uh, became a thing and BXF6 is a suite of documents, 2021 part one, two, three and four, um, and those are currently undergoing their FCD ballot. Um, anybody who's interested in that and has a BXF system, uh, those should be published, I would hope, uh, because I don't think the FCD ballot's particularly controversial. Again, those should be coming out around the September timeframe. Uh, so the latest requirements to do with BXF, particularly um, some of the interoperability between BXF and other systems should be coming to a, a, an IEEE shop in around the September timeframe. The other big bit of work is the media device control protocol over IP. And there's a lot of liaison work uh, going on there with the AES and with some of the ITF folks and some of the FIMS work that's been done uh, to try and have just one media device and control protocol, um, which is supported by AES, SMPT, um, AMWA and, and the likes. And as I said, another project which has been started and I've had the first meeting is the Media Microservices Architecture, which is all about defining microservices uh, that make sense within the broadcast infrastructure. So Joel, I believe we have a question. We do. Um, Philip would uh, ask that you define the term microservices. You know what? That is job one for the microservices group. Uh, so those that have been following the trend for microservices uh, in the internet community will know that uh, we used to live in an era where services were big, ugly, hard to change and hard to define things. And the trend for microservices was to have an API endpoint, an application programming interface endpoint that lives in the cloud or lives on-prem that you would call with a URL that did one thing and did one thing well. And if you do one thing and do one thing well, effectively that's the definition of a microservice. So in this context, in the context of a broadcast plant, you can probably do better than my, um, my flippy floppy uh, definition that I've just come up with. And that's really step number one for these guys to define what's a microservice, 
what's the suite of microservices, and what's the vocabulary that we're going to use, because the internet community doesn't really have a clearly defined agreed vocabulary, and within SMPTE, if we're going to make it a standard, that's kind of step number one. Did I forget anything, Thomas? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, in my eyes, it was always, uh, you know, in the past, we had uh, monolithic uh, software applications, and uh, these uh, were cumbersome uh, to update, and um, so uh, the trend in the industry was really uh, to um, uh, break these monolithic silos up into uh, different parts and uh, have uh, uh, software pieces which can communicate with each other and uh, that makes it easier, you know, if you update one of these components uh, to just swap it out and update and uh, without uh, uh, breaking uh, the system or uh, having a complete um, uh, uh, shutdown of the system to update it. So, uh, and you have a lot of these um, uh, functions, let's say, which run in these uh, different software pieces uh, in media applications and, um, for example, encoding, scaling, uh, uh, a color conversion, uh, and you can break up uh, these these uh, function in, in uh, different parts and uh, trying to categorize these uh, to to come up with them and categorize them and uh, is I think one part of this effort as well. Excellent. Any more questions come in on that one? There is actually. Um, Mark says uh, microservices are being studied in the ISO IEC JTC1 work. Any plans to establish a liaison and synchronize the work? So, Thomas, do you know anything about liaison with the ISO? It, it rings a bell. I actually, I, 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 that might be something I forgot about. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I know that we talked about it, and that was, I think, during the uh, TC meetings in Toronto. But did, I have and... to look in my emails uh, to see what the actual plan was to engage. Um, Indeed. Because that specific group was mentioned um, at Toronto, um, and in fact, there's several liaisons were encouraged. Um, the groups literally had one meeting at the moment, and Thomas and I are, are currently looking at um, our, the various liaisons that we have to try and establish rapporteurs uh, to, to, to have better liaisons in this kind of area. So currently, I believe we have a written liaison with that ISO group, but I don't think we have a rapporteur or a head of delegate. At delegation at the moment and it might be if this becomes a successful project over the next few months um, that it becomes important to have a physical human being who sits on both committees uh, and makes certain that we have um, excellent communications between the two groups. At the moment they've had one meeting so um, we're, we're trying to be just a little bit um, in encouraging to, to have the discussions without being too prescriptive at the moment. Very good, thank you. All right, this is our last technology committee and we've got um, 18 minutes to go. So again, I'll rattle through this because we've got about 15 minutes of stuff on documents to do at the end. So 35 p.m. is uh, all to do with IMF and the interchange of uh, masters. Um, IMF is the interoperable mastering format. We've got some new projects. So the first of SIMPTE's specifications um, is, is coming through this technology committee. As mentioned, we've got this isochronous stream of XML documents, and we've got the new project to cover the GitHub work to look at the issues and the issue trackers and figure out how we're going to address them to fix the bugs in the standards. The projects that are continuing are SMPTE 2067 part 200, and this is how does the dynamic metadata for color volume transformation, uh, DC, or DMCVT, or to you and I, HDR metadata uh, and wide color gamut metadata. How does that live in IMF? So that's what is happening at the moment and that's gone through its first ballot and is undergoing comments. We've got a drafting group that's looking at a vocabulary for specifying the audio content kind. In other words, is this test material? Is this a stem? Uh, is this music and effects? Is this um, audio for the visually impaired? Is this audio for the audio, audially impaired? Um, so all of those vocabularies need to def be defined, and that's what this drafting group's doing. There's also an IMF plugin that takes the work of SMPTE 2098 Part 2 and says how to use it in IMF, as well as a revision of Application 2E. And for those of you who are IMF experts out there, one of the big questions being considered is, App 2E contains everything in App 2. 
do we keep app two on the books or do we just roll it all up into app two e and then pour concrete on app two and archive it so that's one of the big questions being considered we have had a very large number of very successful IMF plug fests. The most recent one uh, was in Munich in May and jolly good fun it was too and we had some fantastic results. Um, I'm able to reveal that we had over 50% of the interoperability um, matrix of all the makers and the receivers had zero defects. That's absolutely nothing could be detected that was even a minor glitch and that is a phenomenally good number. Uh, and that's up from 25% uh, three months earlier. So this is really good. And the next plug fest is taking place at Ampus, you know, the Oscars building, uh, between the 18th and 19th of October. And we'll be testing uh, some app 2E as well as testing the output profile list. Um, and if you don't... Bruce, just uh, quickly, I wanted to mention that there is an, uh, also uh, an IMF user group, uh, I think, which is run through HPA. Uh, is that correct? correct? And uh, so if you're interested to join that group, um, you know, go to the HBA website and uh, I think there's a link on there, right? Um, there's a link on there and that will take you to IMFUG, imfug.com, which is the IMF users group. And that's run by Pierre Lemieux, who is also the chair of TC35PM. Yeah, and they regularly meet, um, uh, I think they had an HBA meeting and then um, uh, they also have an IBC meeting. Uh, so at the great uh, uh, trade shows, they are present as well. Yeah, and I, I highly recommend joining the IMF users group if you're into IMF. Um, it's the only forum where people who are doing real commercial things with IMF will stand up and tell you how it works in their plant. And they'll tell you what was good and what was bad and what we need to fix. Um, so the discussions in there are really, truly operational discussions and you learn an awful lot about how to make an IMF facility work uh, by going to the IMF users group and getting the um, the nuts and bolts of how to make it work and then going back to SIMPTI and figuring out the technology that you need to use. Now, if you are a member of TC35PM, you'll be put into the GitHub uh, SIMPTI TC35PM team and those teams are able to get at these private repositories and the private repository contain the various lists of things that we're considering for inclusion in the revisions to all of the IMF specifications. So, Item number one here, which is an epic. I'm not going to explain that because you don't have time. Um, but again, if you if this is a topic you're interested in, how does GitHub work for SIMPTI? We can do that as a special request. Um, this is one of those big topics that we need answers to, and this is why we're doing it in GitHub because there's an awful lot of discussion that can be happening in slow time, so that by the time we get to revise the document, we know what we're doing. Any questions on TC35 PM? There are no questions. Um, I am placing a link to the IMF users group in the chat box for everybody so the, they don't need to go look for it. Fantastic. And if you run a small company or you're a consultancy, um, joining the group is free. You just have to um, sign the um, agreement to make certain that you don't tell everybody about everything going on. So here we have about a 10 minute quick dive on SIMPTI documents, uh, the Bruce and Thomas double act. Thomas. What documents do we publish? Well, uh, they're engineering documents, uh, which are standards documents um, and recommended practices and engineering guidelines. Um, to make that all work, uh, we have the operations documents. Uh, there is the operations manual, uh, which uh, we talk about in a moment. And then we also have administrative guidelines, which explain how to use the OMs. Oh, so um, that, one, that one's what to do and that one's how to do it. <laughs> exactly. And then uh, we have other documents uh, which are advisory notes. So if we find out there's something wrong with a standard, uh, we can warn the industry about this deficiency so that they can work around it. And we have uh, RDDs, uh, registered disclosure documents, which are uh, if you as a, um, as a technology provider want to bring your technology to SIMPTI, you can do that uh, through these uh, registered disclosures document without creating a standard or an RP or um, a similar. Um, then uh, we have the new uh, 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 technical specification from SIMPTI. So Bruce is going to talk about that, I, I believe, uh, in a moment. 
Yep. Uh, we have engineering reports, which are usually the output of a study group. Uh, so people get together, uh, discuss the technology, and then create a report. For example, uh, the VR and AR uh, study group we have at the end, uh, we're going to have a report about that. So you will learn about uh, what's uh, what happened there. Now, what we've done in these slides is to actually put down the definition from the operations manual, because the operations manual tells us how to make standards. We have to follow those rules. So Thomas and I believe that we're free thinking humans, but we can think freely providing we follow the rules in the operations manual. That's how it works. So what we've done is we've highlighted some terms in red so that you understand what the document is. And then we've given you the one sentence summary at the bottom. So what I'm going to do is basically read out the red stuff and then Thomas is going to read out the dark stuff. And we're going to go through that for each document type and then we're going to we're going to do this quite quickly because we haven't got much time and then we're going to go to a flow chart which is possibly the most interesting thing I've, you know, I've done in the last three months. So the OM that describes the duties of the engineering and standards officers and the policies and procedures that we follow. So in other words... Oh so, so it's my cue. <laughs> <laughs> that was your cue. You dropped the ball, Thomas. <laughs> Try that again. In other words, <laughs> uh, we try to make uh, it really helps us uh, to make uh, uh, standards and uh, the various uh, operations manuals. And uh, uh, here we go. Uh, Bruce. So, right. Let's try this again with the, the administrative guidelines. So the, the OMs tell us what to do and the AGs tell us how to do it. So they provide certain extensions and how to interpret the operations um, uh, manual. And AGs are made by the Standards Committee to help us make better standards. So in other words... They, they explain how to implement the OMs. It's pretty much that. And they're freely available. You can, you can get them um, on the website, you, you can navigate to them, and you can read the AGs, and they're a pretty dry read. So our main document that we make is a standard, and that basically gives you the basic specifications, dimensions, criteria that are necessary for effective interchange. A standard about with full rigor suitable for international referencing. So this, uh, these are documents which go through a uh, due process in SIMT. Absolutely. So this is the, those are the big ones. An RP um, contains the same sorts of stuff like specifications, dimensions, criteria, but they're not really necessary for the interchange. Uh, they're probably more like conformance or measurement methods or constraints on existing specifications. You see, we, we haven't trained this at all. <laughs> so, uh, it's really about how to use the standards or a standard. An advisory note really details an issue that we've discovered. Um, advisory notes are not long term because we should go and fix the standard, so they're limited term benefit. And advisory notes are withdrawn after the issue it describes are resolved. You can find them on the web, but they're typically all been withdrawn because we don't have many and we've to withdraw them after six months. They're really for if something went wrong or uh, something is about to happen with a standard or an RP or... Yes, often things don't go wrong, but we need to tell somebody that might go wrong and to give them a heads up. So a registered disclosure document is not an engineering document. It's of general interest to the industry and generally a sponsor will come along makes a disclosure of something that they have, typically technology, and it has to be within Simpty's interest. So we don't do RDDs on how to make concrete, for example. Yeah, Simpty uh, publishes and uh, uh, these technologies proprietary, proprietary designs, really. So the new one is the technical specification. There's been a demand for something that's not quite a standard. So for example, an application for something like the UK's Digital Production Partnership that references some private metadata, that couldn't be a standard because you can't reference the private metadata. However, what it does is constrain a standard and reference this extra new stuff, which is not and probably never will be standardized. So this is much more a specification, something that gives you an operational practice that can be well done. Um, and what we've done is we've created a SIMPTI technical specification process, which literally follows the operations manual to create a committee draft, and then using the powers available in the operations manual section 9.3.1, if you want to go and have a read, the standards vice president can make it publicly available. 
So a technical yeah. specification is something that is a committee draft made public. Oh, wasn't that my section? <laughs> oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I thought I was trying to be nice and, and, and get, give you all the stuff that we hadn't rehearsed that might have been a tongue twister or, or maybe just on the edge of, of not quite finished yet. I'll tell you what, why don't you do engineering guideline and that will give the audience something oh, different. Oh, carry on, to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so an EG is pretty much tutorial. There's nothing informative. It's intended as a user guide and it provides designs or procedures for producers. It's uh, how to use a standard. Hooray. And an engineering report, as Thomas has already eloquently said, is typically from a study group and it's an informative document or a TC or a task force. Yeah, they're the result of the study group. And if you have trouble sleeping, I thoroughly recommend the use of time code in MXF, which is a good bedtime read. It's only 35 pages long and it will help you sleep. I absolutely guarantee it. So to close off this webinar, um, we put together this handy little flowchart, which we think might actually be true, but it's for discussion because some of the phrases in these boxes might not be 100% the best words that we could use. But what we'd really like to do is take the whole of the operations manual and that presentation that we just gave and turn it into a flowchart that helps people understand what document they think they're trying to write. So where we are today is these words. And if you can think of better words, please let us know because we'd like this to be something that goes into an AG in the not too distant future. And you, the audience who've never seen it before, you're our best buddies to help us get this right. So firstly, as we said early on, you start with a doc. A doc is needed. We've got to write a document of some kind. You ask yourself, are there normative provi provisions? Is there something that shall be done? If the answer is yes, then you ask yourself, am I defining new technology? where I'm defining how to use technology that exists. So if you're defining new technology, you then ask yourself, is the technology going to be stable? Is it going to be kind of global? Would I want, for example, the Nigerian government to reference it for their national broadcaster? If the answer is yes, then it's probably a, you want the full rigor of, of a full standard and it's going to be an ST. But if you say to yourself, well, no, not really. You then ask yourself, do I want something that's agile, small scope, a bit less rigor, references something proprietary? Um, in other words, like half a standard? If that's the case, then you're probably looking at a technical specification, which technically doesn't exist yet. But by the time people work through this, um, um, this flowchart, hopefully we'll have finished the TSP process. And if the answer is no, if basically it's something that you've already got, it's technology that you've had in the field for a long time. And a great example of this is, for example, the GXF format, which was the format on profile disk servers, which had got to the point where um, Grass Valley wanted to publish that so that people could have a repository to be able to read the billions of GXF files in the industry. So they came to Simpty and said, we'd like to publish an RDD of GXF and that RDD is now in the SIMPTI repository and has been remembered for all time so that if in years to come um, you pull a GXF file out of the Library of Congress and you want to know how to read it, that RDD hopefully will give you enough information to be able to read the GXF file stored in that repository. If we bump up a little bit to the use technology, if we're going to use some technology, for example, how do we put a new VANC packet into VANC in SDI? What did and S did should I use? You go, oh, of course, that's RP291 because you're using technology and adding constraints and different values or properties to an existing standard, ST291, and that's what RP291 is for. If you're not making normative provisions, then you're probably doing some sort of guideline or study. If it's a guideline, that guideline might be an engineering guideline, such as EG42, which tells you how to put descriptive metadata into MXF. Or it might be a process to tell you how to use the OMs. So administrative guideline AG22 is 
how to make a TSP. So it tells you how to interpret the operations manual to run a technical specification project. Um, and hopefully that will end up freely available to um, anyone who wants to download it from SIMPTE uh, in the September timeframe. We're looking good to be able to do that. And the final one might be a study group. So you'll remember early on TC10E is doing a study into VR and AR. Well, the output, output from that study group will be an engineering report, which will be freely available on the SIMPTE website. And one of the jobs that Thomas's team has been doing is looking in the back catalogue of all those engineering reports that we've made, and we're looking at how we can get all of those online for you so that they're all easy to find in the one place. Part of Bruce's policy of trying to make SIMPTE searchable and make content easier to get at. And I see, unfortunately, Thomas, I kept talking and didn't give you your one minute of freedom. Go on. Did I miss anything? Is there hey, something I that should have been in there? No, I, I think uh, you're, you're spot on, and uh, some of the um, study group reports are on the Simply website. Um, I forgot uh, uh, which uh, category they're on, but um, you f can find them there, and they're, I think they're in the publications. Uh, the, the one comment I m may make uh, is, uh, or actually two, uh, the, we left the um, advisory notes out here, so just for simplicity, and uh, uh, maybe there should be a feedback loop from the technical specification into uh, standards, because you can take a, a technical specification and uh, once you decide it's stable enough and there's uh, implementations and you, you might want to turn it into a standard, then you can do that. And because it's a, a public committee, a committee draft, you can pick up where you left off and just uh, feed it into the uh, standards uh, workflow. Absolutely. So Joel, do we have any comments? I know we're out of time, we're a minute over, but I know that some people love this stuff. Um, there's still quite a few guests still on the line. Um, any comments, questions, observations? Uh, th there is one from Alexander, um, and it uh, relates to uh, your uh, goal of uh, making SIMPTE searchable. He says, Bruce, when you took up your role, uh, one of your aims was to make SIMPTE searchable. Have uh, you had any success in fulfilling this aim? I have a lot of allies who are helping me coordinate the massive amount of underlying data so that we can put search engines on the top and make it searchable. So there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of volunteers are helping and I think we're making good progress. You're probably not going to see anything, Alexander, for the next six months because there's a lot of groundwork to do to suddenly do a bit of a ta-da moment. Uh, to get stuff out there but yes I'm having success and I have to say having Thomas on board is fantastic because somebody who understands what's required uh, as my right hand man uh, makes me feel comforting and warm. Well we want you comforting yeah, think... and warm. <laughs> <laughs> same, same here uh, Bruce and uh, I just wanted to mention this is it's quite complex uh, it, it really requires us to look at our workflows here at uh, SIMTHQ and how we get uh, uh, documents out. So um, it's it's not a short-term task uh, and uh, there's just uh, a lot of understanding which way we want to go. Indeed. So right. Joel, I have, I have a quick question for you if there's no more questions. Did you manage there to is. get us a little poll? Um, I, you know, as soon as you mentioned it, I scrambled and I made it and I will put it up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And, Let's do the last questions and then we can surprise them with the poll. Certainly. First, Alexander says, thank you, uh, Bruce, Thomas, and Joel. Um, but the, the last question is uh, from um, uh, Wilfred. Uh, can NMOS IS 0405 and 06 eventually become a TSP? That is a question for AMWA and the owners of that technology. What we're trying to do within SIMPTE is put forward a specifications facility for organizations like AMWA, like the DPP, like Neighbor, uh, like anyone um, that takes advantage of the SIMPTE infrastructure and provides a long-term repository of the specifications that trade organizations that are created for a single purpose, if they want their specifications to be long-lived, SIMPTE is there uh, to provide this facility so that those specifications can live longer than the duration uh, for which a, a specific trade association was formed. 
It's not to say we want trade associations to die, but we have been approached by organizations that have said, you know, we, you know, our, our reason to exist has kind of vanished, but we've got all of this work, what do we do with it? So the specifications process is there um, kind of a, a facility to the industry uh, to provide a, a long-term memory for some of these specifications. I'd like to thank uh, Bruce and uh, Thomas for uh, spending the hour and a half with us, but I'd also like to thank our guests for taking time out of what has to be busy schedules. Everybody who uh, participates um, works very, very hard uh, to uh, progress the industry. And uh, we will see you hopefully next time on a SMPTE standards update web webcast or one of the webcasts in our technology series.